Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah, we've been going through the book of Isaiah. We've been looking at Isaiah from chapter 13 through 23, you know, over the past 10, 12 weeks. And um, we've seen God as the God of nations. Uh, he's, he's pinpointed certain nations in, in those passages there. And, and the judgment that was going to come down on those nations. He's, uh, he's talked about the Assyrians and Damascus there, uh, Babylon, uh, the Moabites, Cush, Egypt, Edom, um, Arabia. He even talked about Jerusalem for the way that they were living, you know, his own, the, the chosen people. Uh, he's going to come down on them in judgment for the, for the way they've been behaving. And then last week about Tyre, uh, that in, impregnable uh, fortress out there uh, in the sea, uh, and the two, the two rocks out there, the island cities, plus the, the main city there on land. Uh, and, and so we've been talking about the God of nations. Now it switches for the next few chapters here, chapter 24, 25, 26, and 27. We see him as the God of the earth. God of earth, God of heaven. And, and so uh, I'm looking forward to next week and the week after that because uh, there's some really good, encouraging verses there. Uh, not that there's not here, but it's just, man, we've been on judgment. You know, God's wrath coming out, and it's, and it's still going to be poured out today. And so we're going to look at that today, primarily the, the, the judgment of the earth here that's going to happen. Uh, what's he talking about, and how does that apply to where we find ourselves today? Um, and, and so we're going to start in Isaiah, but I'm going to pull a, cu a couple other chapters out of the Bible from other uh, books and in the Bible, and we'll see how that can apply to us as God's children. And so if you take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah, chapter 24, and I'll read through it here, um, and then we'll, we'll go over it, and, and hopefully uh, uh, God will be um, glorified. I just got a new pair of glasses finally. Last week was, that was, that was, Arduous would be a good, good word. I broke my glasses. And, and so then I go to Myers yesterday because I'm tired of wearing Karen's glasses. And I just didn't feel very manly coming up here wearing Karen's glasses. So, so I bought me a pair. I was in a hurry. They were all kind of wrapped up. I think I got them a little too powerful, you know. So, but I tell you what, I'm looking through a magnifying glass. So if you look at me and you see really big eyes. Here. Any difference? Anyway, let's open in prayer. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus Christ. And we see Jesus Christ all through your word. And we see him in Isaiah and we'll see him today. And, and God, I, I, I never want the name of Jesus to become boring or just an everyday thing that happens in my life. But God, I, I always want to be excited when I hear the name of Jesus. I always want to be excited when I, when I can come to you and pray because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on my behalf. And, and so God, today we, we praise Jesus Christ for what you've done for us. And God, Father, for allowing him to do that, for having this whole plan put together, even why while you were forming Adam with your hands and, and, and creating him, you knew, Jesus, that you were going to die for our sins and what that was going to look like, but what it was going to accomplish. And so, God, uh, we praise you. We thank you for your, your love letter to us, your word, and that you've said that not one dot of the I or cross of the T will pass away from your word till everything is fulfilled. And as we go through this chapter 24 and, and the next few chapters over the next few weeks, God, we're, we're looking at a time when it will be fulfilled. It's kind of a dualistic message right here because it, it was applicable to the time that you gave it, but it was also uh, revealing things that are going to happen in the future. 
the, the already and the not yet. And, and here we are uh, in between that. And so, God, help us to, to glean from your word. God, that you might change us, that you might grow us, that you might give us the boldness that we need to have as, as your children, as your ambassadors today here on this earth, this little sphere, this little speck of dust in, in light of all your creation, the speck of dust that you, you see the inhabitants and you love so much. And so, God, help us to be excited to be able to be a part of your life and your word and the eternal kingdom. So, God, use me today. May your spirit just have the freedom to move through my lips, my mind. God, because apart from you, it, it's nothing. It has no power. And, and it's not me that has the power. It's you working in, in each and every one of us. So use me today, God. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, starting verse 1. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for the master as for his servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish with the earth. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. The new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The joyful timbrels are stilled. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song. The beer is better to its drinkers. The ruined city lies desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. In the streets they cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom. All joyful sounds are banished from the earth. The city is left in ruins. Its gate is battered to pieces. So will it be on the earth and among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten or as when gleanings are left after the grape harvest. They raise their voices. They shout for joy. From the west they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the islands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear singing, Glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away, I waste away. Woe to me, the treacherous betray. With treachery, the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare await you, people of the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare. The floodgates of he the heaven are, heavens are opened. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is violently shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls, never to rise again. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed. The Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. And so, uh, so that's an exciting time here. And so here we are again. Uh, Isaiah, we're not really sure of the time that Isaiah received this here. Um, and again, uh, in Isaiah's time, the, the known world was pretty much around the Mediterranean Sea there, right? And, and so over here is the east of the Mediterranean. You have Israel over here, and you have uh, the Phoenicians right there where uh, Tyre and Sidon are, and then Egypt and Spain over here and Greece and, and all around there and, and off into the lands a little bit. And, uh, and so uh, through this, historically, um, things have been happening. Kingdoms have risen. Kingdoms have been destroyed. There, there's been this, this 
defeating, this, this struggle to rise on top. And, and even, you know, we had uh, Attila, the Hun, right? And uh, back in, what, the 5th century, he's going around, uh, known as the scourge of God as he goes through Europe, wiping people out. And then in the, uh, a little after that, you have the Vikings, right, coming in, and they're, they're destroying people. And then, and then Genghis Khan comes in, and, and um, sounds like a lot of people might have uh, Mongolian blood in them from uh, Genghis Khan's uh, uh, battles and things that he's done. And, and so World War I, World War II, you know, let alone all the wars in between that, uh, nations have risen and nations have been defeated. And, and even then, you know, we have what was called the Black Plague back in what, the uh, 1300s, 1350s. Through, uh, I was reading on that here a while back when this was coming out with the coronavirus scene, what we were comparing, you know, uh, back then, uh, they, they guesstimated 75 to 200 million people died from the Black Plague. And then, um, and then they call it the Spanish flu. I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody. It didn't start in Spain. But they're just the ones who fessed up to, hey, we have it here. Uh, there, uh, um, about 50 million people died um, from that, from what I understood. Um, today, I was... Uh, where we're at, I just kind of looked last night on the world a meter. I don't know, it's just a new site, the world a meter. And um, there it's, it's uh, clicking on how many people are, have died and, and how many people have gotten it. Uh, so, worldwide, um, um, I got to put my glasses on here so I can see what I said here. Um, Five million four hundred thousand people about have gotten the the virus, and there's been three hundred forty four thousand deaths. Um, so not quite as many as the pandemic. Um, 1918, they had a the H1N1 flu. About fifty million people died. Um, and so here we find all this going on, and and these are what are just in a sense just mere dress rehearsals, right? For what the big event that's going to happen here when Jesus Christ comes back. And, and that's why I kind of think this is alluding to as well. It's kind of got a dual message here um, because it'll say things that are like, okay, this is not going, there's no restoration apart from God when it says these things here. And so let's just kind of see how this uh, comes together. As we we're preparing for the great tribulation, the end times, um, we were talking, David and Pastor and I were talking. Um, we've talked to more people about, uh, they're concerned about where we find ourselves with this coronavirus. And, and, and I, I'm not saying that this is the end time here, but, but I'm not saying it's not either. I mean, this could be with the technology that we have, with the, the whole world. I, I, I said, I asked Google last night, I said, how many countries are there? And, and Google told me there was like 194. But then when I looked at the coronavirus on the, uh, the, um, the pandemic thing, it said there was 214 countries that had the, the, the virus here. So, uh, but we, we just know all this stuff and, and everybody knows what's going on around the whole world. There's no, there's no really delay. Uh, I can talk to, when, when my daughter was in Ukraine, I could see her lips move, and the words came out the same time her lips were moving. And, and, and I would ask her, and she would reply. And, and so instantly, with the technology that we have, and, and could this be God's last uh, op saying, hey, everybody, look to me. This is it. I, I don't know. But I do know that, there, that we are to be ready for an imminent return of Jesus Christ. He can come at any time. And so I want to be ready. And so with this and this passage here that just came together here, uh, there are some hard times and God is saying, my judgment is coming out on the earth. And, and there is going to be a wiping out of people. And it has nothing to do with the amount of money you have. It doesn't have anything to do with the, the, the house that you live in. It doesn't have anything to do with how popular you are, whether you're an introvert, extrovert. Um, it has, the only thing it has to do with you is that you're alive and sucking air. 
If you are doing that, it has everything to do with you. God is not discriminating in His punishment here that we see in this time. So let's kind of go back through this and then just apply it to our lives. And so in verses 1 there, we see that there is this God's wrath is being taken out on the inhabitants and the earth itself in verse 1. And everyone is equal. And, and no position is going to prevent you from being affected by the wrath of God, His judgment coming down upon the, those workers of iniquity. And, in, and we see there in verse 3 that the earth is laid waste. Um, it's, it's just plundered. The earth is completely laid waste and plundered. That's kind of uh, Isaiah 65 when we get there, Lord willing, if he, do, if he tarries and he allows us to, Isaiah 65, we'll get there. We'll see some of the same verbiage going on. A little different look at it, though. Um, Zechariah chapter 9 through chapter 14, uh, talking about the same thing. And then the book of Revelation as well. And, and some of the same ideas and pictures that were going on with the earth in, in the book of Revelation during the judgments of God are even mentioned here in the latter part of this chapter, chapter 24, as God's wrath is being poured out on man. And, and the question is, why is this happening? Well, in verse 5, it says, The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. And so here we see it's due to mankind's sin. The earth is defiled by people. And the earth is affected by sin. Even the earth, Paul says, even the earth groans and is waiting for that day when it can be restored again by God. Um, they've disobeyed the laws. Um, we have homosexuality rampant today and, and people uh, approving of it and, and transgenderism. And I'm not, I'm not against the homosexual person or the transgender. I'm more upset about the ones who have been in position to say these law, set these laws and saying it's okay. Uh, people need to stand up and say, no, this is a violation of God. God loves you as a person and he expects more out of you. But we have the laws coming into place and, and, and people are, are violating his statutes. Psalm 119.9, I believe it is. How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to your word. By living diligently and with purpose according to your word. How many of us as Christians can have that said about us as well? We live in this broken world, right? It is a sinful world that we find ourselves in. And we talked a little bit about this last week. How, how we're trying to live for God. We have the old nature, that sin nature, but we're no longer in bondage to sin. But left on our own, we kind of navigate back to sinful desires and lusts. And that's why it's so important that we keep the... The God of earth, the creator God, the lover of our soul, the one who died for our sins, at the very focus of our heart, our life. That's why we're in the word of God daily, that we're taking heed according to your word so that we might walk purely. Because left to our own, we struggle. That's why Paul said, I am battling here. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And I'm struggling here. Who can deliver me from this death, this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. He's the one that sets us free. He's the one that empowers us to live victoriously. These, this judgment is because of sin. It's been a violation of the statutes. They've broken the everlasting covenant. We have the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Davidic covenant. Uh, there is also the Noahic covenant, right, with Noah. When Noah gets off the ark there and God says, Never again will I destroy the, destroy the earth by a flood. And I'm setting my bow in the, in the sky to remind me of this. He also said there that there shouldn't be any shedding of blood of man because we are image bearers of God himself. And... and 
I was on that world meter, world meter again last night, and I said, I wonder how many people, how many kids have died through abortion. Um, they say it's 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 put out by who, right? The the World Health Organization. They say 40 to 50 million babies are aborted yearly, and um, and they had this little counter thing, and I went one. Two, I waited for it to get to 70, round number. That's where I was at. One, two. By the time I got to 10, it was at 15. So every one and a half seconds, um, two kids were dying by abortion. And then I was reading a little lower. 22% of all American pregnancies end in abortion. When, when God uh, moved in David and he says, I am fearful, you've knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There is a God who says, that little person inside you is a person, is a baby, and I've knitted them together. And we've killed them. And that is murder. Murder. And uh, we are going to be held accountable for that. And, and I think we are in violation of the Noahic covenant when we allow this to go on. We can be angry at the mother, but we need to be more angry at the people who have allowed those laws to be put into place. The mothers need help. They need somebody to come alongside them. Maybe we need to add that on our website as well. Hey, are you pregnant? Don't know what to do with your baby? Bring your baby here. We will find a family for you to take care of that precious little baby that's been formed by God himself. Maybe there's something we need to add to our website. But I'm not going to add it if you're not going to be willing to be a part of that. Wow, that's a lot of death. And then we see in chapter 24, verses 6 through 13, i got to move on here, that the majority will be destroyed. Um, the curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up, and very few are left. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about God, though. He doesn't wipe out people completely, right? I mean, we see that with Noah, right? He was able to be on the ark with his, his wife and his three sons with their wives. And, and so God kept a remnant. And all through, so far as we've been going through here in chapter 1, uh, verse 9-ish there, chapter 6, uh, we see God, how he, he's wiping out nations for, for their sins, but there's people that are turning their lives back to him. They're looking back to him and saying, I understand why this is happening, Lord, and it's because of my decisions here of turning my back on you. And so, God, I, I ask that you forgive me. And God forgives them, and, and he keeps a remnant, and he restores, a, and he, yeah, he has a remnant that he's restoring the earth with. And, and so here we see that he's not completely uh, wiping out all these people. But as they're there, as the ones that are being destroyed there, if you were to go to verses 16, the latter part of 16 down through the first part of 18, um, uh, terror in the pit and snare await you. So it's, this is like out of the frying pan and into the fire kind of thing. Uh, it, it's, it's bad to worse. There is no escape. You're, you're fearful, you're, you're terror and it's your worst nightmare, and you think you're caught, you think you're getting out, but you're not you're getting away. You're going to be consumed by the judgment of God. There is no escape. But, again, we see, just kind of clipped away here in, in verses um, 14 through the first part of 16. This is the remnant there are, there are people who are turning their lives to God. They raise their voices. They shout for joy. Um, are you, are you kind of picturing what's going on here? 
they raise their voices, they shout for joy. Oh, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what would you say? Are you cri- yeah, I'm a Christian. You, you sound like you're ashamed of it. Well, I kind of am, but praise God, I'm a Christian. No, these people are saying, we have come through this. We are so glad there's a God who saved us. There's a, we are so glad there's a God who's redeemed us. Um, our lives, our lives that we're living today, are they shouting out that I am a Christian and that there is a God who loves me, who has redeemed me, and he is worth to live completely for? Or are we kind of like the chameleon? Um, hey, Brother, sister, how you doing? God is good. We go to work. Nobody knows you're a Christian because of how you live. Maybe you're not partying. Maybe you're not swearing. But you're definitely not sharing Christ. You're just a good old boy or girl. So here we have the song of praise in this, this passage here. They're singing praise in spite of the hardship they find themselves in, we find ourselves in a hard time. What's your heart doing? Is your heart, or is your heart, praise God. Lord, you've allowed me to be here for this time. Lord, let me represent you well. Lord, in everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, God, may you have the glory. May you have preeminence in my life and my heart so that I live appropriately before you because you're the one who's in control of everything. You allowed President Trump to be president. You've allowed Joe Biden to run against President Trump. And whoever running mate he has, whether it's Gretchen or some lady from California, from Florida, I don't know who he's going to have. But God, you're the God who's in total control. And Lord, no matter what happens, I'm going to praise you. Lord, no matter what happens, I'm going to live life with a smile on my face. Because you are God, you are on your throne, and you love me. And you win. And I am on your side. Lord, use me. And because of that, I shout for joy. Because of that, I can sing praises. Because of that, I can come and boldly worship you. God, you are worth it all. You are good. And so we sing praises. I mentioned earlier, Job, how he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Uh, Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk. Uh, I, I just love the book of Habakkuk. Just a little, little background for you. Habakkuk is ticked off the way the nation's living. He's like, God, we are living so unjustly. We are righteous. The people who are in power are just screwing everything up. Lord, you need to fix this. And God says to to Habakkuk, okay, I'm going to bring the Babylonians in, and they're going to defeat your nation here. And then Habakkuk, this this dialogue, whoa, God, what are you doing bringing these heathen in to do something that you should be doing? And God's like, hey, I got everything under control. They're going to come in. They're going to do my will. People are going to be killed, but a lot of people are going to turn back to me. And eventually I'm going to destroy the Babylonians. But Habakkuk, I want you to know, when I say this is going to happen, it's going to happen. And I just love how Habakkuk ends this. And this is really where we can be at today as well. And in Habakkuk chapter 3, and starting in verse 16, he says, I heard and my my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. And he's talking about uh, the Babylonians coming in with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail, And the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in in the God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Where are you at today in this time that we find ourselves in? God's God never said it was going to be easy for Christians. Um, Where I read it, Jesus says, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And and so 
uh, you need to get your life like, okay, God, I know they hate me, but I love you more than they hate me. And so, God, with that, I can rest in you because I know you have my life in your hands. Take my heart. Take my mind. Take my attitude. And I will sing praise to you, the God of my salvation. Our level of worship and praise is not situational, but personable. It's found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then lastly, we see here in, in chapter 24, verses the latter part of 18 through 23, God's judgment coming down on the inhabitants of the, the earth and, and earth itself there back in, in Isaiah. And um, it talks about the floodgates of heaven are open, the foundations of the earth shake. The, we get this imagery in the book of Revelation too as, as these judgments, these bold judgments and the trumpet judgments are, are being uh, exacted out on the earth and its inhabitants. Some kind of the, kind of the same um, verbiage is going on. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is violently shaking. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in a prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed. The Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. And so here we see the, the judgment of God coming out upon the earth. Um, in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9, where we, we've talked about this before, how, how God is not slack, he, he's, he's patient, and He's not willing that any should perish, okay? He, he wants everybody to come to repentance. But then the next verse, verse 10, uh, Peter says, hey, the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night, and, and after that, the earth is going to be burned up. I love Hebrews chapter 1 there when it's talking about the supremacy of, of Jesus Christ as God. And, and it's talking about how of his superiority there and, and how he's the creator and, and the creator of the earth. But there's going to be one day, I just like this illustration, he's just going to, it's just going to roll up the earth like a robe. It's just going to, I'm starting new, I, I, I'm going to keep the, the, the sphere here, but I'm going to roll its exterior up here and I'm going to start new. And there's going to be the revived earth. You know, the, the, it's groaning right now. It's waiting to be rolled up and, and made brand new again. And, and, uh, and so I just like that, what's going to go on there. And so the earth, God is judging the earth. And then he's also uh, judging the demons there. It says, in the day the Lord will punish the powers in, heavens, in the heavens above. And uh, last week we were talking about um, how... Satan is really the one behind all, all the, the garbage that's going on behind the nations. Uh, there was a picture as we were reading in, in uh, Isaiah there, uh, Babylon, Satan was behind that. Uh, in, in, uh, in Tyre, as in Ezekiel there, uh, we see that Satan is, is behind that. And so he's basically the puppet master, right? And we have these kings who the puppets are. And... Um, Satan doesn't know who the Antichrist is going to be, but I think he, every, every uh, generation or every kingdom, he's, he's trying to mold the person that he wants to, to become that Antichrist because he, he doesn't know who it's going to be. He, um, I don't think God has revealed to him because God didn't reveal to Christ when he was on earth when he was going to come or anything like that. And so I still don't think he's revealed that to Jesus Christ. That's just my opinion there. And, uh, but, but because... But I feel because Satan doesn't know who's going to be the Antichrist, he's always trying to work in people's lives, developing and molding the person that can be that, that world leader, that one world leader. But, but he's got a lot of puppets. He's got a lot of puppets in Congress, right? And, and we look at them and like, my word, how in the world could they make such a decision? Well, it's because they are being used by Satan. 
and, and his evil forces there. And, and in Ephesians chapter 6, we see how that, that hierarchy is all set up there. And they are, you know, we think we got a good army in the United States or a good Marine, you know, a good militia. Uh, that's nothing compared to the demonic world that's going on there. Well, God is saying, you think you're powerful, Satan. You think you're able to win. You're going to be judged here. And we see that uh, the culmination of that in the book of Revelation where, where Satan is then bound for a thousand years, thrown in the pit. And, uh, and so all demonic influence is gone, you know, out of the earth. And... and um, and even all those that oppose God are, are gone out of the earth. And so for the thousand years, it was only people at the beginning who, who loved God and said, we, we, we don't want to take the mark, uh, and, but they're having kids and everything. And so uh, after that thousand years, Satan's let out of the pit, and, and then they, uh, they follow him like the sands of the sea. That's how gullible we are. <laughs> and, uh, and they follow him. But... Here we see them being judged. And, and, and Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, talks about some of them are even right now in the dungeon. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. 25. As we wrap this up. In Matthew chapter 24, um, his disciples asked him, you know, um, about when are these things going to happen? Um, well, they call him to, to attention the buildings, and he says these things are going to be broken down. But he's, he's not talking about the end times there. And, uh, and he gives the, the, the Olivet Discourse there. And he starts talking about the end times there. And, and the desolation, the abomination of desolation, and... And, uh, and then verse 26, um, no, that's, I want to go to 36. But the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. I've asked, I've asked myself, and I've even asked some of you, I wonder what it was like. In the times of in the days of Noah, where they always were doing only evil, and and so I've, I've been trying to watch people who are not Christians. Okay, um, I do watch Christians as well, and some of them are doing evil, but but a lot of the the, the unsaved are always thinking evil things. You know, how can I do this? How can I get that? You know, and I'm like. God, where are we at compared to the times of, of uh, Noah there? Um, but here we have God's judgment on the earth. Just, just start looking at that. Just start looking at people that you know are unsaved and start, God, what, what are their thoughts here? Listen to how they talk, what they think about. Um, he, he's he's going to judge the demons. He's judging the earth. He's going to judge the kings of the earth. Um, but then I love chapter 25 here, and this is... This is really where I want to kind of end it and bring us this all around here. We know that there's an end time, right? We know that there's a finality to this world. And, and even if God tarries, we know that there's a finality to our life. But, but in this portion here, it's, it's talking about being prepared when, when Christ returns. And, and we have the parable of the ten virgins. And, and, and they hear that the groom is coming, but five of them didn't have their oil. If you, I'm just giving you a paraphrase here. So the other five, they're like, we're not going to give you our oil. We don't want our cam candles to go out, uh, our lamps to go out. You go get your own oil. They go and, and they, the, the bridegroom comes, takes the five virgins that have their, their lamps, and the others are left behind. And he says, watch there. In, in the last part of that, um, verse 13 of 25, Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know the day or the hour. And then he goes on to tell the parable of the bags of gold and the three servants that the master gives them. One, he gives five bags of gold, another two, another one. And, and then the master leaves for a while, right? A picture of Jesus Christ coming to earth. Now he's left, he's in heaven. 
And one day he's going to come back, and we know he's going to come back. And this picture here is of the, the two servants that knew he was coming back and were prepared for him to come back. And so they've taken what God has given them, the gifts that God has given them, is the, the application here for us, is God has enabled us with certain things here to be used for his kingdom. And, and so when, they, when God came back, he expected each person to give account of the, the things that he had left entrusted to them. And, and uh, two of them did good. One did not. And, and he was um, rebuked and obviously thrown into the lake of fire in this illustration here. And, and the thing is, 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 is heaven so important to you that you're willing to watch? We, we know that Christ is going to return, and I'm not saying that it's because of this pandemic that this is the last hurrah before God returns, but I'm not saying it's not either. But it does get us to think, and in light of the scripture that we've been reading here, we know that Jesus Christ is going to return, and there's an expectation that he has of us. And even if he doesn't return for, for us today, even if we fall asleep in him before he returns, there is still that same expectation of that meeting of Jesus Christ. Are you prepared? Are you watching for his return? And then are you, using, are you using the things that he has entrusted to you in this life as his child that you are impacting his kingdom? Is he important enough to you to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, and while I'm trusting in him, I will give him my all. I will take everything you've given to me, everything you've empowered me, and I will use it, God, for your glory. Because no matter where I'm at, that's my mission field on your behalf. Because, God, I know one day you're going to come back. And I know there is going to be a judgment. And if we were to read on there, we see the sheep and the goats, where they are thrown into the dungeon here, basically. And then they're called out. And then they are judged and thrown into the lake of fire, all the goats, all those who don't, who don't know Jesus Christ. Do you have unsaved family? Yeah, pastor, I have unsaved family. I'm praying for them all the time. Well, have you talked to them? Have you come and came face to face with them and said, I've been praying for you. I love you so much. And I know that one day we are going to take our last breath. And I'm going to be on the other side with Jesus Christ. I want you there too. Do you love them enough to share verbally? You, you've been given a job. Many of you go to work. Um, when school starts up again, you'll be going back to school. I've learned one thing. It doesn't matter if I go to a Christian college, Christian school, there's unsaved people there. And uh, I, want them to make, I want them to prove to me that they are a Christian. You're here at this Christian facility, prove to me that you're a Christian. You come to church, prove to me that you're a Christian. And uh, because one day we're going to see our Savior face to face. And, and, and he is going to love us. And, and we're going to see as we get in, into the next chapter too how he wipes the tears from our eyes. Why are we crying? One, there's tears of joy that we've made it. But I think there's tears of joy uh, and also of regret. Like, oh my word. This is so beautiful. Why didn't I tell so-and-so. We find ourselves today, are we watching? Like five of the virgins. We are to be profitable for our master at his return. We are to be touching lives for Jesus Christ. Looking for Jesus and anticipating uh, heaven needs to take precedence in our life. The God of heaven needs to have preeminence in our life so that we might live watching, serving, and joyfully shouting proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and, and we thank you that you, you revealed judgment that's going to occur 
God, it's, it's not something that's going to surprise us. Like, whoa, I never knew that was going to happen. But God, you are saying this is what's going to happen for those who are not found in me. Oh God, thank you that your wrath is not upon me. Jesus, thank you for taking my wrath upon you. And so, Lord, help me to live appropriately. Help me to be proclaiming Jesus Christ to a world who has no hope. To a world that even now many are looking at eternity wondering, if I get this virus, will I live or will I die? God, through this, may you be honored and glorified. God, may there, may there be Christians that say, God, I have not been living my life appropriately. God, move me from this spot where I am at today closer to you so that I look and resemble Jesus Christ. God, grow us and use us. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.